the spine of the episode is about their meeting. It was an exciting, thrilling thing to watch happening even as we were shooting it. Once we realized that we're kind of getting a charge out of just seeing this happen on a set, which is a notoriously boring place, we had a sense that it would carry over to the finished version of the scene. That audience chamber was built by Aegon Targaryen to intimidate anyone who came there. You stand in the presence of Daenerys Stormborn of House Targaryen. He doesn't have much insight into what she's gone through. So I think he sees a rich girl with a fancy name sitting in a big chair with a fancy dress on, proclaiming herself the queen of the world. So I don't think he's looking upon her with as much respect as she has come to take as her due. He's a very strong-willed person. He didn't come down there to bend the knee. He didn't come down there to join her in her fight against Cersei. None of that matters at this point. All that matters is fighting the dead. If they get past the wall and we're squabbling amongst ourselves, we're finished. She looks at him and she thinks, this is some unwashed barbarian from the north and a bastard, his name's Jon Snow, yet he's calling himself king. If she knew what he'd seen, she'd be looking very, very differently at what he's telling her. But at this moment in time, she only sees somebody who's trying to carve up her piece of her kingdom for himself. And if what this guy is saying is true, then it really is uh, an issue. And she has her own very serious issues to deal with in the shape of the woman who's now sitting on the throne. This is a murderous, vicious woman, Cersei Lannister, who's capable of insane amounts of brutality without a second thought if she feels like it's what needs to be done. And by the time you get to the end of episode three, it's not at all clear that the playing field is nearly as lopsided as it was when we ended episode one. Everyone kind of realizes that the two poles of power for Cersei and Jaime at this point are King's Landing and Casterly Rock. But Jaime also knows he doesn't have the forces to defend both and makes this strategic decision to give up Casterly Rock, you know, to use it as a decoy, to lure the Unsullied over there, to take it and to get them on the exact wrong side of the continent. The siege of Casterly Rock is so much about what doesn't happen, you know, how it goes contrary to expectations. So in order for us to understand that it doesn't play out the way Tyrion expects it to, you really need to hear Tyrion's expectations. The gates of Casterly Rock are impregnable. The fight up the walls will be hard. We will be at a disadvantage. What he thinks the Unsullied are going to find, which all seems true up until the very end. Where are the rest of the Lannisters? Jamie goes after Highgarden, which is, for him, much more valuable because Highgarden's the Tyrell stronghold, which commands all the most fertile regions of Westeros. They're the wealthiest house, but fighting isn't really their forte. I mean, they're just not known for being the most fearsome warriors. So to have a long, extended battle there didn't make a lot of sense. We decided to cut to the chase and cut right to Jamie, single-mindedly making his way to the person he's there to see, which is Olena Terrell. It's done. It is. Did we fight well? Uh, as well as could be expected. Jamie finally gets to turn the tables on someone. He finally gets to kill one of his enemies, which we haven't seen that much throughout the series, and she still wins the scene. The one thing she does have left to live for is the thing she saves for the very end of the scene. The piece of information she's been sitting on since season four. You don't think I'd let you marry that beast, do you? She beats him in the middle of her own death scene, and there's nothing he can do about it. He knows it's true the moment she says it. Tell Cersei. I wanted to know it was me. We've been so lucky to have Diana on the show. I, it's impossible to imagine somebody doing the job she's done with this role. And I think this scene is probably my favorite scene that she's ever done for us on the show. Sensei. 
I wish John were here. Yes. I need to speak to him. Your father's last living true-born son. You're Lord of Winterfell now. I can never be Lord of Winterfell. I can never be Lord of anything. I'm the three-eyed raven. I don't know what that means. It's difficult to explain. Try, please, for me. It means I can see everything. Everything that's ever happened to everyone. Everything that's happening right now. It's all pieces now. Fragments. I need to learn to see better. When the long night comes again, I need to be ready. How do you know all this? The Three-Eyed Raven taught me. I thought you were the Three-Eyed Raven. I told you it's difficult to explain. <sighs> Bran. I'm sorry for all that's happened to you. I'm sorry it had to happen here, in our home. It was so beautiful that night. Snow falling. Just like now. And you were so beautiful. In your white wedding dress. I have to go back inside, Bran. I'll stay a bit longer. <laughs>